you will, look with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 9. I want to read for us from verse 1 down to verse 11. And as I've mentioned to you previously, each of these trumpets is somewhat parallel with what we saw in the seven seals. Same sorts of things happening on earth as a direct result of, of uh, God ordaining it from his throne. Seals represent authority. Trumpets represent warning. So it's just different symbols of the same thing. Revelation is a symbolic book. I suppose if Hollywood were to get a hold of Revelation chapter 9, they'd probably make a pretty good science fiction movie out of it because we have locusts coming up out of a pit and uh, wreaking all kinds of havoc. And sadly, uh, this is how some would even interpret it. I remember back when I was in school uh, listening to men that were trying to fit this into some future event that was to take place. And so they said, well, rather than reading locusts here, we ought to read helicopters because that's what's going to be prominent when this takes place. And so they put it all in the future. But I'm telling you that uh, Revelation, just like all of Scripture, uses what's called figurative language. We, we do it all the time in our speech. And uh, it doesn't take away from, from this having a literal interpretation. People always think, well, if you spiritualize it, then it's not literal. Well, there's a literal natural interpretation to things, and there's a literal spiritual interpretation. That's what I'd have us to see today, the literal spiritual interpretation of what we're about to consider. But let's read this in verses 1 through 11. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him. You see, that this is what I'm talking about, figurative language. A star is used to describe a person. I saw a star fall from heaven, and to him, normally you would think it, but to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. So imagine here seeing just a big old chimney with just with smoke beginning to billow out of it, coming up out of the ground somewhere, just black smoke. And it says, the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Now, just to show you how far men, again, with a literal natural interpretation will go, I've heard some say, well, this is talking about pollution that eventually is going to take over the world and destroy uh, the environment, etc. See, that's how natural minds think. All right, we can't, that's not the sense here. We're talking about something spiritual because it's out of a bottomless pit. And there came up out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, just to situate, you remember back in chapter 7 and verse 2, uh, before all of this began, uh, you remember the Lord ordained that an angel would go and actually seal. You see there I, in verse 2, Revelation 7, 2, I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth of the, and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. What it's showing is that although there are judgments that God is bringing upon this earth and this world, uh, these judgments are not toward the Lord's elect. That's who's sealed there. Remember we saw sealed 12,000 of each tribe. That's true Israel. That's the spiritual Israel of, of Christ that he redeemed. And now we're seeing through this trumpet, though, 
a judgment uh, that it says here to hurt only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. So this is a work that will be done upon the reprobates, upon those that God has passed by, and he's just to do so. A lot of people have an argument with that, but he's, he's just to choose whom he will for salvation. He's just to pass by and to condemn those that he passes by. And, and the proof is right here in chapter 9. How great must be that judgment then that's using this symbolic language to describe it. Now it says to them it was given that they should not kill them but that they should be tormented five months and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. So we're talking about a, a judgment that God brings upon these that's just that, that they would prefer to die than to uh, endure this. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And again, notice the word like. Uh, we're talking about sim symbolism, similitudes. Like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as you see, these are all similitudes, as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, not a name to give your child, uh, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. And you look in the marginal reading, maybe in your Bible, it says uh, that is to say a destroyer. So one was the same name in Hebrew and Greek, same meaning a destroyer, a destroyer. And then it says, one woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. So we see here in verse 1, the fifth angel sounding, and John seeing a star falling out of heaven to earth. As I said, when you read this, the clue to understanding this is right in the same verse. Many times in scriptures, you just read one more sentence <laughs> You don't have to go run into a book somewhere to try to figure out what this means. To him. So this is a star falling from heaven, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Who might this be? Well, if you look over in Luke chapter 10 and verse 18, our Lord used similar language to describe the fall of Satan as a star from heaven. It describes that glorious position that he had with God in the beginning, and yet he fell and, and brought many angels with him. And here in Luke chapter 10 and verse 18, our Lord to show his eternality. This is what a lot of people miss in this, but when he made this statement, he was declaring himself to have been there when Satan fell. Here he was as a man on earth, and yet he says here what? He said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. You see? And then he says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Isn't it interesting that the same sort of language is used, locusts and tail like a scorpion? These are all, these aren't good things. If you've ever... Uh, we used to have to always watch for scorpions when we lived in Africa. You could never just go and put a, put a shoe on in the morning because scorpions like to hide in dark places. And one of the nice places I was up in the front end of your shoe. So if you didn't take and shake that thing out before you slipped your foot on it, I had some friends that were stung that way. They'd get their foot in there and, and stir up that scorpion. Next thing you know, they're yelping and dancing around and you can't figure out what's wrong. Well, there's a, there's a scorpion stinging them and they're just struggling to get that shoe off. 
See, that's not a good thing. But that's how Christ describes Satan. There's no good thing in him. All right? And, and I saw, but he said, I saw Satan fall from heaven. So if there's, you see how Revelation ties together everything we know about Satan. Just sums up in one verse here uh, his fall, but also his, his power, his domain of power. It's the bottomless pit. All right? That's what we see uh, described here. All right? He's the prince of darkness. And notice again in verse 1. These are just some subtle little things to pick up as you read the scriptures. It says, And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. We're going to talk about why it's called the bottomless pit here in a little bit. But uh, this is in no way saying that God has turned power completely over to Satan, as if somehow now he shares equal power with God. You remember back in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, how is the Lord Jesus Christ described? Remember that all of these trumpets and seals, it, it comes from the throne. It comes from him who's seated upon the throne. So he's directing all things that take place in heaven and earth and, and <clears throat> with reason. Because in Revelation 1.18 it says, I am he that liveth and was dead. See, this was a reassurance to the church of that first century that was going through all of this trouble. I am he that liveth. They put me to death, but I rose again, as Brother David read in Acts 13. I'm seated now in the, in the heavenlies. I was dead, but he says, Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. He not only has the key of salvation, but he has the keys of hell and death. You know, I've heard people make this statement, uh, you know, if you're saved, that's God. God gets the glory, but if you go to hell, that's your fault. No, God, he has the keys of hell and death. He's just as just in ordaining you to eternal condemnation because of who you are in Adam. Just as just. There's nothing that just kind of slips through his hand or passively happens. Not with our Lord. He's ordaining all things. I, I love it when scripture reading fits. <laughs> exactly what's being preached. Brother Dave and I did not consult on what he was going to say, and yet everything he mentioned about God's ordaining fits exactly what we're looking at right here, you see. But here's what's of interest. Every little detail is important. Did he give, was he given the keys of the bottomless pit? The key, one of them. That, that's a, it's like you say to somebody, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you in the back door of the house uh, to feed the cat. That, you're not giving somebody an authority over your house just to go in and open any door or any drawer and use all these other fine keys. And No, it's, it's one purpose. And that's what we see here. God is ordaining, uh, his son is ordaining for a time. And again, we're going to see described here five months is what's described. That, you know, different commentators say different things about that. But what I see there is a limited time. A limited time in which he's given power to do what what uh, he should do. But uh, again, we see our Lord's sovereignty even over Satan. Where Satan can't even do from the pit of hell what he would do unless the Lord gives him that authority. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. Uh, Satan has no key but that which may be given to him and that for a while only. And I believe that here it clearly describes that as being only over a part of hell, which the abyss here represents. All right? That's how it's described. Now, in the final judgment, it'll be, it's described as the lake of fire. But here it's described as a, as a bottomless pit. All right? So let's just look at this in Revelation 9. What is the significance of the bottomless pit? Well, you know, we read here that Satan in essence, opens a shaft of the abyss. It's like, like a furnace, like a chimney. It's, he's got, he opens this. This is what we see here. And what it does, it, it incites to evil and fills the world with demons, with spirits. You know, Paul said, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but with, with principalities and powers 
in the darkness of, of, of evil, you see. And that's really what's being described here. As this shaft is opened, it, it begins to belch forth just columns of, can you imagine just in, in your mind, dirty, dark, black smoke that you would normally see coming out of a furnace. I know we may not see much of that here, but back where I grew up, up in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, they used to call Pittsburgh one of the dirtiest cities. It was a steel city. And uh, I remember spending summers there and just seeing just black smoke coming out of those refineries that, that uh, just, it, it's, it smelled, it covered everything, covered everything. But what does smoke do? Stop and think about it again. There's a reason why this language is used. Smoke obscures vision. Where, where if, if smoke were just to fill this, this area right now, we wouldn't be able to see like we ought to. It, it obscures vision. And I believe here, in a spiritual sense, it's talking about Satan given the power to deceive. You know, if, if you've ever driven in down a road and all of a sudden you hit fog, your whole perception, you lose perception. You, you get frightened. It's like something's coming around you and you start hitting the brakes and you imagine you see things and there aren't and sometimes you don't th see things that you should. You're just completely turned around. All right? I believe that that's, what, that's why the Lord, the Spirit here, uses this language. And it's dirty smoke because it signifies corruption of sin and uh, that which contaminates can anything good come from hell? <laughs> Can anything that, that Satan produces ever uh, be of any good? And it's from the very pit of, of, of moral darkness, of degradation, of blindness. Again, coming back to Acts chapter 13, it's interesting, the language, if you read it, as, as David was reading, of course, you didn't have the forethought of knowing what I was to preach on here, but look how Paul denounces Elymas, the sorcerer, who withstood these servants of the Lord. It says in verse 9, Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. So that subtlety and all mischief, that's what's being depicted by this black smoke coming out of hell. There's nothing good in it. And if Satan, the point is, if Satan is given the authority by God to, to deceive and to cause one who's not the Lord's to, to, be, to be influenced by him, uh, a lie, we talk about a lie from the pit of hell. It could be even something that in his mind he thinks to be good. Why? Because his whole perception is turned around. This is smoke. He's just, he's trying to figure things out, but he's not doing the right thing. You see? He says, thou enemy of all righteousness. It causes one, it, and isn't that what Satan would delight to do with men more than anything else, cause them to be confused about the matter of righteousness and how they can be just with God and to set them about establishing their own righteousness rather than seeing the righteousness of God that Christ worked out in his obedience unto death. And he says, wilt thou, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? I truly believe as we, as we read here in Revelation chapter 9, this is what this fifth trumpet is all about. Up to now, we've seen four trumpets and God's judgments being brought upon the world, vegetation, the sea. He's the God of the land, of the sea. We saw that. But dear friends, there is no worse judgment that God could bring upon this earth than to cause men to be deceived with this matter with regard to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that what we're seeing here in Revelation 9 is describing those periods of time when God, according to his purpose, has caused men to be deceived. They would not, they would not uh, bow to Christ anyway. And what God has done is, 
cause them to be, be doubly blinded, if you will, by giving Satan this authority to go forth and to, and to, to deceive and delude. It's a very serious matter, I realize, but it's, it's something that we have to weigh, especially in our day. Uh, to me, when I finished reading Revelation 9, I was just, I was dumb. My mouth was shut. I sat at the desk and thought about, think about how, how rare it is even in our day, to find any that have any interest in true righteousness. Everybody's running around trying to defend their own. Everybody's running around trying to establish their own. And it's all being done through works religion. It looks good to natural man. And you try to speak, you try to, speak to people to warn them, and what do they do? They get upset at you. They get upset at you. I believe that's describing this, this blindness, which is what smoke is designed to do. It's, it's so black, thick and gloomy that it blights, blots out any light of the sun and darkens the air. So as a whole, again, I believe that's what's, what's pictured here. And it's a frightening scene. If you stop and think about it, very frightening. Uh, in fact, if the Lord has given you light and you are one of those that he has sealed so as not to be blinded by it, you wonder at people still stumbling around in false religion, stumbling around uh, trying to, to work their way to heaven. And, you, and you, you read scripture to them, you talk to them, and yet they won't hear you. And you just, you, you just can't believe it. What's the problem? Blindness. Blindness. And unless the Lord, uh, they are one of the lords that he will deliver in his time, they'll go to their grave in that blindness. They'll go to their grave. You know, uh, there are many in this world today who are subject to this very power of the bottomless pit. If you look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I read this during our Bible class, but uh, here it is again, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. It says in verse 3, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world. Now look at its little G-O-D. Why is he the God of this world? Well, he's been given one key, one key among the many to go, with authority to go around and blind. Not the Lord's elect, not those who have been sealed by election or sealed by the blood of Christ, but those who have been passed by. He's given authority. That's why he's called the God of this world, who hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light, you see that? The light of the glorious gospel of Christ. That's that smoke that obscures the light. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. That's his, that's his prerogative. That's his authority. He's been given permission by God to carry out his wicked designs in the hearts of the children of men leaving them to their own wicked devices. How so? How so? Well, I've written down here two ways that I see in Scripture. And these I didn't just make up. You can read these. We'll look at some of these verses ourselves. How does Satan deceive men today? How is this being manifest even today in the hearts and minds of men? Well, through works religion. Works religion. Is it as bad as what we say? Well, it was pretty bad for Cain. Go all the way back to Cain. When he sought to approach God based upon the works of his hands, which is what he brought, even the best works of his hand, he was not accepted. He was rejected. But works religion sets men to doing something, either to procure their salvation or to maintain it. A lot of people don't realize it, but there's a lot of grace preached in works religion. <laughs> it's a hybrid. I, how many people have you talked to who said, well, we believe that we're saved by the blood of Jesus. It's all by the blood of Jesus, isn't it? It's all by grace, isn't it? But then they'll turn right around and say, but if you don't do this, you could lose it. See? You mix grace and work. What is that? That's that smoke that blinds men's eyes. 
uh, works relig religion sets men to doing something either to procure or maintain a righteousness that they feel has given them acceptance with God. I'll tell you what, in this blindness, you cannot talk a person out of it. <laughs> Sometimes you can look and tell them, boy, that, that profession you've got is be based on nothing but works. You can't talk them out of that profession. That's that blindness. That's that blindness. The only reason why we've renounced it is why? Because of the revelation of the Spirit of God. God's granted us repentance. We've been sealed. <laughs> But to the rest, it's going to look as real. You can't talk them out of it. It's as real as their own name. And uh, rather than see and perceive the one true righteousness of God in the person of Christ, and that which he has worked out, that God has imputed to his own. If you look in Matthew chapter 23, look at Matthew chapter 23. See, that's, that's what we read here in 2 Corinthians 4, lest they should see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. What's the glorious gospel of Christ all about? Him working out the righteousness. God imputing that righteousness uh, based upon his death, you see, to his own. So that's the blindness here in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 15. This is what our Lord said to the scribes. And isn't it, isn't it interesting that the same word woe that we see here with regard to this, this works religion is repeated over and over again in Revelation, what we've been seeing. One woe is past and two more are about to, to come. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land not to make one child of God. You can't make a child of God. A child of God is one already so by election, already so by redemption, already so by the call of the Spirit. In other words, manifest to be a child of God when the Spirit calls them, grants them repentance. But see, religion says, no, you become a child of God by something you do. We've all read those little tracts that say how to be born again. And it sets a person to doing certain things in order to be born again. That's the work of the Spirit to do, you see. But he says they compass land and sea and land to make one proselyte. A proselyte is an, an, an adept of religion. They've learned certain things. They've been catechized. They've been baptized. They've been sanctified by somebody and, and, and pronounced whole by man. That, won't, that may stand before men, but it won't stand before God. There's only one righteousness that God considers. That's the righteousness of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You're either clothed in it or you're not. But He says here, when He is made. And this is talking about modern day evangelistic programs. How, how active people are in trying to go out and witness and supposedly win souls. And what it is, it's proselyting. And it says here, you look how serious it is. When He is made by men in his decisionism and profession it says ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves that's that bottomless pit that's Satan's lie what better way than for Satan to make somebody feel that by something they did they've actually gained acceptance with God and I'll tell you we every one of us here if the Lord's taught us there was a time when we were deceived in the same manner by our own nature the only reason why we're delivered is because we weren't a child of the devil. We were just, you know, sometimes you go through that smoke, but it doesn't, it doesn't, in, in, you know, it doesn't stop you. It might stop somebody else, but it doesn't stop you. God graciously brings you through it. And that's when you get through the other side, you think, I'm so thankful he delivered me. So thankful. But that's what it's describing here, works religion. But also, look here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 7 through 12. Not only works religion is, is a way that Satan deceives many, but a religion of signs and wonders. You say, well, isn't it the same thing? Yes, it's smoke is smoke. But it, it's a different way of, of blinding people. Aren't people today that we deal with caught up with signs and wonders? 
Look at where the greatest numbers are of people. It's, it's, it's where something's happening. You know, I, I remember growing up in a, uh, a church, uh, not a church, a congregation up in, in Cortland, New York. And I remember they brought in this, this uh, uh, so-called Christian magician one time. And it was a woman. And uh, this was a church where I got a gold pen for memorizing 500 verses of the Bible. And I got a picture of Jesus standing at the door. You know, that, that old picture. I was, I was given that award of a gold cross to put on my lapel and a picture of Jesus to hang in my room. Amongst all this idolatry, one time we had this Christian woman magician show up that brought fire out of the ceiling. And to this day, I don't know how she did it. But she was up there on the platform. And I'm sitting there like a, a little kid, five years old, watching this going on, five, six years old. And there's fire coming out of everywhere. In fact, to show her power, she even they blindfolded her and did all this, and she got in the car. We all went outside. She got in the car and drove around the block blindfolded to show her powers. And after all of this, she went back in and gave an invitation. Now, you tell me how this stuff is all connected. For people to come forward and believe in Jesus, it's witchcraft. It's witchcraft. That's, but people are fascinated by that sort of thing. You draw a crowd. You get people running. See, that's, that's what the Lord had to deliver me from. I grew up with this stuff. And it was called Christianity. We had our Bibles. We were reading. It was just one more plug in the, in the whole scheme of things. Now when I look back, I shudder. I shudder. God could have left me there. But he didn't. But there are the, those that he has. And they continue to be deceived. And I believe that's what, what is described here in 2 Thessalonians 2. Again, this is describing this period. Paul says in verse 7, the, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. What iniquity? Well, this bottomless pit. The workings of Satan. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. In other words, the Lord still keeps a restraining hand on what Satan can do or not do. But... Look here, when that wicked one shall be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the work of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. You're going to, try, you're going to have friends. You're going to, you're going to have acquaintances that are going to try to get you to come to special meetings. Come on over here and see what's going on over here. You're going to be called upon to weigh these things. What, what's going on over there do, that I need? If I have Christ, if I have his word, if I have the revelation of, of, of his gospel revealed in my heart, and I have that righteousness imputed in Christ by his death there at the cross, I need nothing. That's all my acceptance before God. I'm not, I'm not looking for some sign. I'm not looking for some wonder. What did Christ say? It's an evil and an adulterous generation that seeks after a sign. And look at here. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness. Because if it's not the righteousness of Christ imputed, it is unrighteousness. That's how God declares it. In them that what? Perish. It'll continue to be so because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, here's the smoke, God shall send them strong delusion. That's what that fifth trumpet's all about, strong delusion that God will be pleased to bring, that they should believe a lie. To them it's the truth. That's why you can't talk them out of it. But before God, it's a lie. Let's just bear that in mind here in Revelation chapter 9 as we, as we go forward. And I, I'm not going to be able to cover it all today, but this is the introduction. Let's bear this in mind, that uh, this is one of those trumpets. And what are trumpets for? Warning. Warning. <laughs> That's what this is. God uses even the work of the devil as a punishment and as a warning for the wicked and the causes of not repenting and submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness alone. 
You notice, uh, in spite of the trumpet sounding, coming back to Revelation 9, you see how verse 21, this isn't designed to cause them to be saved, but to be delivered. This, this is a judgment. This is a judgment. It says, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Every one of those words describes false religion, describes works religion. Men will not repent of it. Why? They've been deceived. They, they can't believe it's not true. And people will say that to you. You telling me that after all my dedication and commitment and giving and witnessing and doing all these things all my lifetime that that doesn't even weigh in the balances of God's righteousness? No more than a... a a speck of dust might move a balance. <laughs> no more. Altogether, it's, it's, it's worthy of condemnation. We know that none will repent unless God grants it to them. That's why I, I continue to set Christ for I'm, I'm not trying to convince anybody. I'm just declaring. The Lord knows those that are his. But I know this, in the smoke and the darkness that Satan would have men deceived by, there are those that God will cause to hear the voice of Christ and bring them forth. Others will perish. They'll perish in it. But God will cause them to come forth. And that's what a, a faithful minister of the gospel is to do. I'm not supposed to try to go around and twist arms and try to get this one. A goat is a goat. A sheep is a sheep. <laughs> Always has been. You're not going to make a sheep out of a goat. You're not going to make you're not going to make wheat out of a tear. See? But as, you de as, as, as I declare, as you witness of Christ in this dark and evil generation, the Lord still has his sheep that he's going to be pleased to, to call out. And, and if they come, it's because they were his all along. 